All right. Todd, thank you. Um, so first, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about who we are as a company. And, and we're a little bit different than, I think, than a lot of the other innovators that are here today. Um, we're a bit more mature company. Um, we're actually publicly traded on the Toronto Exchange. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't have a big idea. Uh, we hold true to our big idea. We hold true to our innovation. And we think that we're really at the cusp of something that is so mass market and so achievable by ourselves and everyone else here in the room that um, you know, it, we're, we're honored to actually be here at the launch forum to actually collectively try to get some help from you to actually create a movement to make this happen and make this a reality. So um, my name is Jay Nalbach. I live uh, in Portland, Oregon. Um, we have three offices right now. We have Victoria, BC, Portland, Oregon, and um, Pamplico, South Carolina. Um, just recently, also, we announced that we are acquiring a facility in Western Europe. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, I've been with the company for two years. Uh, I'm a 15, 16 year veteran of the footwear and apparel industry. And when I came across Kralar and actually some of my colleagues and um, our CEO, this was like the first time, this is the first real innovation where I felt that I was able to not only affect the brand that I worked for, but actually positively affect the brands that we all know and love. More than, not one, not two, but all brands in the textile space. And um, I hope that everyone here will agree, and I think uh, we've got a lot of work to do and a lot of opportunity ahead of us. So the way we look at the market now, Right now, as we stand, there are about 75 million tons of fiber used this year to create fabrics and textiles, 75 million tons. Um, about 60% of that is a synthetic poly-based fiber, 40%, you know, you could call it 30, 35% cotton, and then we have cellulosic and the rest. Um, it's been said and studied that either in the next 15 to 25 years, the fiber demands will double. So we're creating enough excitement, we're creating enough product, we're creating enough demand out there in the world, and these fibers, the, the fiber needs are gonna grow. They're gonna double. And we know already who's really good at creating a lot more fiber. Polyester's really good at it, cotton's really good at it. And for the whole launch forum, we've been talking about the issues surrounding cotton and poly, so I think right now we need to, you know, as Mark said this morning, like there's a bit of a call to action. What can we do to actually continue to feed the demand, to actually deliver profitably, to continue employing the people that we employ, to grow as companies, but also do the right thing and at least give the planet a break. So between now and that doubling, the polyester that will be created in that time period will require 4.3 bar billion barrels of oil. That's not 4.3 every year, that's combined from now until the, until the doubling. If cotton is gonna fill their demand, they're gonna require an additional 84 million acres of arable land. It doesn't exist. The land's just not there. So we have to find another way to kind of clean up our acts, do something a little bit differently, but still deliver the products that our consumers know and love and are demanding. And we kind of, we think of it in a way, we know, that we know the way the movie is ending and now the second installation is gonna happen. And we remind ourselves all the time, if we continue to chart ourselves down a bad course, we're not, bad course, we're not gonna end up in a good place. We need to find a way to end up in that good place using a good course. So how can we bridge the gap? Let's talk about Kralar right now. We believe that Kralar is the first sustainable natural fiber with the potential to revolutionize the textile industry. And we think that there are some very simple things that we need to do as a team and collectively here uh, at the forum to actually make this happen. So our feedstock is flax. And let's talk about flax just for a second. That's the flax plant. Um, you know, a field of flax just looks like a field of wheat, a field of oats or grains. Um, that fiber flax grows to about four feet tall. Um, you can really, you can, you can get a lot of feedstock per a, feed, uh, you can grow a lot per acre. Um, and the whole stalk, the whole stalk of the plant is full, is full of fiber. 
The problems with flax and hemp and jute and other bass fiber plants is that the, the, the cleaning of them is very mechanized. It's very, it's very traditional. It's scutching, it's heckling, it's breaking off the bark and the pith so that you actually are remaining with the usable fiber. But they're still very stiff, they're tricky to use, they're wo woven technologies only. Um, and we were, we were thinking, well, what can we do to actually achieve a full, fulfilling flax's potential? How can we actually allow these plants to live and grow and be a, a valuable part of our entire uh, textile, textile supply chain? And unfortunately, softeners don't work. Believe it or not, a few years ago, Snuggle was our number one softener for finished t-shirts. We couldn't get the softness that we were looking for in hemp t-shirts and flax t-shirts with the fiber as it came out of the plant. So we started working with the National Research Council of Canada, and we started working with some enzyme scientists who were working on um, greening up the paper industry. And the first question they asked us was, they're like, do you even know why it's so stiff? Do you know why it's so scratchy? And we're like, no, I don't know. You know, like, should we just comb it more? Like, how are we going to figure this out? And they said, no, like, we got to get to the root of the problem. We got to dig in here. When we find out what make it, makes it stiff, we might be able to help you. So this is how it works. This is a, this is a flax plant. And um, I've got actually a little handful of flax that everyone can play with later in the, in the discussions. But within the flax plant, you've got all these little bundles of fiber. And they're all right underneath the bark gives the structure to the plant. And then what happens in traditional linen is that you're going to comb it. You're going to scutch it, heckle it, break it, in it, and you're trying to get all the woody bits off. And what you're left with is still a bundle. It's still a little thick, a little slubby, a little uneven. And what, what the scientists basically came up with and what the NRC actually discovered, they said, well, if you guys can get rid of the pectins, if you can get rid of the natural plant glues that are stuck in between the fibers, you're going to soften this up. You're going to make this plant actually live in a real way and not just be a little tiny blip in the market. So the Kralar process between linen and Kralar fiber, there's an enzyme process that we use to actually remove the pectins from the fibers where we end up resulting in a sample that's actually floating around right now. It's actually as close to a cotton staple as you can possibly get from, a nat from another natural plant. And it's also lower impact. Um, we're working with agronomists. Um, I'm sure there are some here that can help us out even further. Um, but right now, compared to a conventional cotton acre here in the United States, the average is about 787, 790 uh, pounds of usable fiber per acre. Right now, we're seeing over three times the amount of usable fiber per acre with appropriate uh, agronomic methods. Also, we're a no irrigation crop. We are only growing in areas that have natural rainfall, that have a natural tendency for humidity, and morning dew. Believe it or not, when we knock the stuff down, we put it on the, on the land, it actually starts, starts to work for us, and then we can take it and put it through the system. The map over here, this is North America. The green part and all moving down into the southeast is exactly where flax can grow. The blue part highlights kind of where cotton is growing. So we can grow on the same land in the wintertime and rotate out in the summer. In the northern climates, we can grow as a summer crop. Europe is the number one feed stock or area for, for flax today, and that's exactly why we started moving into Europe um, and opening up a facility. There's a higher performance quotient, too. We've done some studies uh, on, on NITs. Um, in an 80-20 blend, we saw an increase in strength. It's as comfortable as cotton. We've seen wicking attributes that are akin to a synthetic. It's actually resistant to shrink. We've seen a reduction in shrinkage of the, of, of the garment with the inclusion of 20% of Kralar. Lastly, the dye uptake. It has an affinity for dye. You can actually use less dye to get the same Pantone that we do today with either our cottons or our polys. And how do we do it? We do it all today at just under a buck and a quarter a pound. Now, that's slightly more expensive than the base fibers of cotton and poly, but substantially less than specialty fibers that are on the market today. As we continue to build out our facilities and get more support and actually get the movement moving, 
um, we believe that we will quickly get closer to parity with the other, uh, with cotton and poly in a short amount of time. Another thing that makes this very, very interesting is that it's a seamless integration into the supply chain today. It requires no additional equipment, no startup costs. It goes on, tradition, on all of our spinning, knitting, weaving, and non-woven technologies that we have today. Our company assets, we've been in business since 2006. We have a combined, amongst the, the, the senior management, we have a combined 170 years of experience in footwear and apparel and also in the non-woven sector. We have physical facilities in South Carolina and also now an upcoming one in Europe. And we have an exclusive portfolio of patents that we've worked on with the uh, National Research Council of Canada uh, that we'll have for the lifetime of the patents. Lastly, as I said before, we're currently traded on the TSX. So we believe that the Kralar enzymatic process is the most significant advancement in the natural fiber game since the cotton gin. This is actually bringing the possibilities of vast fiber plants to the mass market. We really think that Kralar, Kralar flax, Kralar hemp, and whatever else we develop can be that third big dog in the fiber market and actually help the cause that we're all talking about today, which is taking it easier on the planet. So what do we think we can get from launch and working with you? We, of course, want to get to global scale. Are there ideas in licensing? Are there ideas in capital? Are there ideas in like augmenting feedstock in different areas in the world that we can actually get to that we maybe haven't thought of yet? Um, explore opportunities for suppliers in other regions of the world. We're a small team. We're only 20 folks. So you know, we're, we, have, we have only so much bandwidth, and we were hoping that we can get a lot of great ideas from the launch team. And then finally, obviously, as I said, establish Kralar as the third mass market uh, fiber. So from our standpoint, we would like to collectively launch a movement with you, with your help, with your expertise, because um, we're on the brink of something really big and uh, beneficial for everybody. So thank you very much. So take a quick question or two before we jump right into the panel. Alex. Um, the water is very impressive because that's a major issue of cotton in places like Central Asia. What about pesticides? We currently are a, a low to no input crop. Um, bugs don't like flax. Um, there are the, 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 the seed that we have been using and the strains that we've actually acquired from Europe are delivered with a small amount of protectant. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. That's all we use. And animals don't like it either because it's so fibrous that they can't even chew it up and eat it. Um, if you do, now, and again, agronomically, like I, I take that discussion because I can talk forever. I can wax on poetic um, about the different advancements we've made from an agricultural standpoint. And we know that we're only like, we're only scratching the surface, really. We know that, that there's a lot more that we can do from a, from a seed stock, from a fiber stock, from a, from a shive wit byproduct where there's a lot to do. Um, so from a pesticide standpoint, there's nothing, uh, nothing added. Um, you sent three samples around. One was the uh, base material, the second one was the yarn, and the third was the fabric. Yes. Were they all pure Kralar, or were some of them the 80 cotton, 20 they Kralar are, mix? They, they are not pure Kralar. Um, we, have, we have not yet achieved 100% uh, yarn or fabric with Kralar yet. It's, we still do require um, a carrier fiber. Um, we do require a blend. So the, the, the cotton or the, the Kralar puff um, is 100%. The yarn is a 40 singles in a 60 40 blend. So that is a 60 cotton, 40 Kralar blend in a 40 single. Um, the colored fabrics that went around are an 80 20. EcoSure Poly, so that is a that is a 100% post-consumer poly blend with Kralar, and then the non-wovens, the wipes that are going around, those are a I think a 94% Kralar flax, and then a 6% tensile. So this is as close as we've gotten now with uh, with those developments on a biodegradable, flushable wipe that we think. Um, could make some inroads in a, in a pretty big way around the world. Bill and then Connie. 
Great. Could you talk a little bit more about your intellectual property? It seems like some of the base uh, IP comes from the NRC of Canada. And could this be applied to uh, other fibers, such as jute? The, the technologies and the enzyme, the enzyme process can be applied to all, bast, uh, all plants in the bast fiber family. So we've already explored and succeeded with flax and hemp. We just, we just did work on jute that came through really like jute's never been seen before. Um, we haven't tried kanaf or um, uh, rami, um, and we're also, just for fun, we were looking at nettles and, and hops and all these types of things, but they all, they're all fiber, they all have fiber in them, so, um, and then it does work. Yeah. Last question, Connie. Um, I'm just curious where the name Kralar comes from and what's the small i? Um, the, it's a, it's a name that was born uh, at the very genesis of the company. Um, it was something that was trademarkable. Um, it was, you know, it was a, it's, it's a Jay and it's I are name. starting it, a boy band. That's it's right. Called so it's called Crayola. That's right. We've, we've already I'm got a, small a I. we've already got a couple of moves. Uh, but the I, the inspiration actually, the inspiration behind the, 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 uh, the I is actually the, the helix of, you know, kind of like the Mobius band of sustainability. And then the top was kind of just an inspiration. It's a little bit human. It's also very reminiscent of the flax plant itself because all the seeds are at the top of the plant. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much.